Mr. Speaker, permit me this opportunity this morning to thank the Almighty God for bringing us here with good health. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that we are at a critical juncture in the politics and the administration of our country. And the time has come when those of us who are called upon to serve will do so regardless of whether being in government or being in opposition. The trend we have seen in most recent times, Mr. Speaker, is one in which there are individuals who believe that they are entitled, entitled to lead, probably not to serve, entitled to be in charge and not to be a follower, entitled to give instructions and to dictate from behind and not fall in line. But Mr. Speaker, we who are here must understand that we are leaders, our people look up to, particularly our children, and so our conduct must be one which resonates in the minds and in the hearts of our people to be proud of. Some of what that has taken place in most recent times indicates the level to which a few have established themselves. And so, Mr. Speaker, their behavior will do nothing but to continue on a downward slide into degradation. And so for us who are on this side, we must stand firm to our commitment of serving the people and not be ashamed to say we are putting the people first. Because the purpose for which we are appointed, the purpose for which we are elected, is for the purpose of the cause of the people of this country. And so let us not lose sight of that cause. And so, Mr. Speaker, when I listened to the Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, on Tuesday, when he delivered his budget address, as it is called, under the theme Health and Security, the Pillars of Sustainability, I thought not only that theme set the foundation, it also set the tone for the direction in which the government is heading. More so, Mr. Speaker, as he delved into the meat of the matter and presented it to us, I couldn't help but reminisce on what was said previously about a month ago and what was said again on Tuesday regarding the performance of the government and what the government has done. And I often say that unless we blow our trumpet, unless we speak about what we do, unless we tell the narrative, it may fall on deaf ears. It may fall on deaf ears because there are those who are making noises, empty vessels, those who will have all kind of, you know, imaginations and things to do to distract people. And so we shall not be distracted. So when I read, Mr. Speaker, on page eight of the Prime Minister's statement, where he says, in my last budget, we promised and delivered paid facility fees for 24,000 primary and secondary school students, procured 10,000 electronic devices for students under, one lap, under the One Laptop Per Child program, made available 
1,200 MiFi devices to households to assist students with distributed learning, paid CXC maths and English fees for all secondary schools, secure low-cost ICT services for income households at $20 per month for 5,000 households, and that's the program with Flow, the Flow Communication Bundle. And next Tuesday, I'm meeting with Digicel to finalize our negotiations, a similar program with Digicel, which will cover another five or more thousand children. Mr. Speaker, you go on further. The allocation of $7 million to the home care program to secure care for the elderly. A program that was tampered with by the last administration against advice. The provision of additional $10 million to the Ministry of Equity to provide social assistance. And the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. And it brought me to the famous Jamaican artist, Grams Morgan, who sings People Like You, a song which was penned originally by Johnny Reed. And in that song, Mr. Speaker, he says, if you give a little more than you take, and if you try to fix more than you break, if you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain, there's a place for people like you. And that is quite appropriate, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister for Finance and all of us who are here who continue to give service, to give a little more than we take, and to fix more than we break. And that is so, Mr. Speaker, appropriate because we could have been on the street today and not inside this parliament having this debate. Because like many other institutions, or if I should say structures of government, they were broken down and not one built. So whether it is the police headquarters on the instruction of the father of a politician, or the custody suites for which we are called upon to rebuild, to reconstruct. Mr. Speaker, they were breaking down more than they were fixing. They were breaking down the constitution of this country, Mr. Speaker, the laws of the land. Because for five years, Mr. Speaker, five years, notwithstanding the fact that the law says we must have a deputy speaker, they did it with impunity and refused for five years, almost moving on to six years, without a deputy speaker. And yet, Mr. Speaker, they come in this parliament and attempt to dictate at what stage should they make their presentation in representation of the people. And then attempt, Mr. Speaker, to say, that they have looked at the standing orders which they disrespected in their time yes. and cannot find anywhere in the standing orders which speaks to the order of speakers. But they disregarded Mr. Speaker. They violated the constitution of the land and felt it was good to do so. All they did, Mr. Speaker, was to break rather than to fix. And then they dig into triviality, Mr. Speaker, when we speak of all the things that we have done in this country in the last two years, just under two years, an attempt to make an issue about the fact that this government decided to fulfill its promise of establishing a youth economy. But what they don't understand, Mr. Speaker, no matter how they twist it, an attempt to make it appear that there, there are programs going on, there are programs. Why set up a youth economy? What they don't understand, Mr. Speaker, that what we have done is to formalize, institutionalize, 
and legislate the youth economy, demonstrating a clear commitment to the development of young people. So it's not a program that you go somewhere, it existed today and doesn't exist tomorrow. It's not a program that can be adopted and then forgotten. It's a program that is enshrined in law. And if you know this government and you understand this government to date, you'll know that this government is a law-abiding government and so the youth economy is a demonstration of our economy. A demonstration, a demonstration of our commitment. And that is what we stand for, Mr. Speaker. And we went on, as we, uh, the, the Minister for Finance went on. He said subsidies, subsidize price of fuel, flour, and rice. Significant. But they would ignore the fact that the government is doing all of this and then speak about the government making $70 million uh, this last financial year. But Mr. Speaker, this is what <clears throat> we got. This is what we take if you want to go according to the words. But we have given more. We have given more with the reduction of that. We have given more with the contributions that we have made. $10 million one place, another $18.3 million, $7.3 million, $800,000, Mr. Speaker. If you go on, the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure as you multiply and add what the government has given in the last year and a half plus, you'll find in, true, in the true spirit of Grams Morgan, we have given a little more than we have taken. My dear friend from Chazelle is smiling because he understands that. He understands what that means to the people of this country. And so, as I said earlier on, Mr. Speaker, we cannot fail to articulate and to let, and to let the, the, the message, the narrative be heard throughout, throughout this country. We just cannot allow this to happen, Mr. Speaker. And I do hope that we all can find the spirit and the energy to ensure that this is not allowed. And so, Mr. Speaker, you move on with the program of the government, and you see the performance of the economy, the growth of the economy. And the only way you can have growth is prudent management. The prudent management of a captain, of one who we say there's a place for people like you, who understands what it is to give and to take, but to give more, to build and to fix and not break, Mr. Speaker. And one who understands if you, if you find a stranger and you, you find time and give a kind hand, there, there's a place for people like you. Right. Mr. Speaker, these are the tenets of this administration. What we stand for, what we do, and how we go about doing it. The presentation, Mr. Speaker, is laced, is laced with successes of this administration. It is laced with things that the administration has done. And therefore, with all that we have done, Mr. Speaker, we understand that there are problems. We understand that there are issues that we as a government must fix. Issues that didn't, wasn't created in one year, uh, one year and a half, but issues which have accumulated over time. And having recognized the issues of the, of the country, Mr. Speaker, the government is saying health and security a must. And having said health and security, we are saying to all of those who believe that it is a problem, that the government must fix the problem, we are saying, put your money where your mouth is and let us make a contribution to that cause of fixing health and security. A small contribution. We started, Mr. Speaker, we started by saying health is too important to allow it to go down the drain at the rate it was heading. And the first decision we took, Mr. Speaker, was to go to St. Jude 
and do a quick analysis of the situation at St. Jude to determine the, stand, the status of the St. Jude project and to put a team, a team of competent individuals and say, you go down there and tell us what the problems are down at St. Jude. We didn't pay a cent to get it done. And if the PM ever paid, you must tell me, because as far as I'm aware, we didn't. But they paid a million dollars for one man to give a report. One man to give a report. Okay? And if we give a little more than we take. And that is the message. This government has constantly looked for ways and means of getting the job done without taking too much. And there are too many, there are too many instances of the former administration taking more than the game. So that was our first commitment of looking at St. Jude. And we realized that in St. Jude, we can go in and get that job done. Let us go to the original structure. And I believe the Prime Minister at some stage will be in a position to give even more details as to what is happening and how we will get that job done at St. Jude by giving more than we take. You look at, Mr. Speaker, the narrative on the St. Lucia Social Development Fund and the great work that has been done under that program, giving more than we take. You look at this Christmas stimulus, $3.2 million, and I'm one who will say we need to put a little more. Put five million for the Christmas stimulus. But we are prudent. But we are prudent and, beg your pardon? Subject to the availability of funds. We are prudent, Mr. Speaker. We are prudent managers. And while we are always willing to give more than we take, we understand what it is when we do not have as much to give more than we can ever take. The Easter stimulus, Mr. Speaker, $3.2 million. Education assistance, $2 million. Hope, $1.014 million. Short-term employment, $6.8 million, Mr. Speaker. And pre-hurricane cleanup, $1.5 million. A government who responds, a government who understands the need of the people, Mr. Speaker. That's the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party and the Blue Wave. So, Mr. Speaker, and you, mo and you move on, you move on, and <clears throat> you heard of the program for the land rationalization and resettlement. A program, Mr. Speaker, that is designed to resolve a number of issues. A program that is designed to go in and get it done and energize the proud to get that program going and to reset our people and to give them the necessary resources so as to, as to have a comfort in, in their living. You know, one of the problems, Mr. Speaker, that many people face with in this country is the unavailability of land easily. Land is expensive, and those who have it, they've all got all sorts of conditions. At the same time, there are people, all that they can do is to rent an apartment, Mr. Speaker, and they cannot afford it. The conditions of some of those apartments, Mr. Speaker, are, you know, are degrading. But what we have seen, Mr. Speaker, is those persons who are in need, who are able, if they're given an opportunity with a piece of land, they will build a decent little house. And that is what this program is about attempting to make land available through the Crown and to give those persons an opportunity to build at the same time the Department of Housing assists with housing assistance and SSDF also assists with housing um, assistance under the normal programming. So Mr. Speaker, this government, even though the naysayers will say, well, nothing has happened, they have done nothing. Nothing is going on. They have stopped them on, on the new St. Lucia that has been planned. But the new St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, was being given to people without money. They came to our shores, empty pockets. We gave them thousands of acres 
while we are now complaining about St. Lucians who are committed to the development of this country and consider them to be non-entities. Non-entities. Mr. Speaker, this government is about giving opportunity. We give you an opportunity into a world of, of, of possibilities rather than to bring the world without any money with the promise of developing the country. You know, Mr. Speaker, one day my barber was telling me, he asked me a question. He said, Mr. King, how do you all go about deciding on investors? How do you know an investor is a true investor? I said, well, they would come, they'd come with a proposal and it would be looked at, due diligence would have been done, etc., etc., and whatnot. I gave him a whole um, litany of what is required. He said, but I don't believe that's what it is. I said, why? He said, well, my friend told me he met a little white boy, and I'm sorry to say white boy. He met a little white boy in, in town, and the little white boy said he was in somewhere in the U.S. in New York walking down the street, and he met a prominent politician here. And they ended up having a chat and whatnot, so the white boy started bluffing his way around and said that he's an investor and he has money, etc., etc. And the next thing he landed in St. Lucia, was able to apply for concessions and he got everything. Wow. Okay? He got everything. So, Mr. Speaker, the point I'm making is we at all times must exercise due diligence and this government is one you can look to when it comes to due diligence. Mr. Speaker, I am one who believes that we, as I said early on, must put our money where our mouth is. Ah. The issue of the removal of VAT on plywood, lumber, steel, cement, and galvanized. One may say, well, it's great. I guess they may denounce it. I guess they may denounce it, Mr. Speaker. But if we look at it objectively, and you probably do the maths, you may say, well, what is the country losing by giving plywood, lumber, steel, cement, and galvanize, given the, the waiver of that? We may be losing more than the $70 million that we're making on, on, on fuel, I'm sure. But I'll wait for the, 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 the verdict. So we may be make, losing mu much more. But Mr. Speaker, what this initiative is doing is just not necessarily the 12.5% that we are giving to all and sundry, it may appear, to the poor, the marginalized, the middle, and the upper class. But what it is doing, Mr. Speaker, once you're able to do that, is to stimulate the activity through the construction sector. Because it means now that there are people who will say, it is time for me to build. The businessmen will say, it is a good time to build because the VAT is off. And so there will be an acceleration of investment as a consequence of this small initiative where business people will say, the environment is conducive, let me start construction of my project. In fact, it would do a number of things. It will provide employment that you may not, you may lose the VAT 12.5%, but your service charge will be collected, and because the volume has increased, your service charge will reflect an increase in revenue for the period of time. I'm trying to build one. I will build one at this time in Chazelle. I'm coming close to you. So, Mr. Speaker, these are the kinds of initiatives. These are thoughtful initiatives. These are not initiatives that are just, you know, fl flown up in the air and taken. These are initiatives where the government has taken time to give consideration and to consider to look at it and to see if I give this, how much can I get? And that's the spirit of, of the budget, Mr. Speaker. The other one, Mr. Speaker, is the waiver of VAT and other taxes 
which is somewhere in the vicinity of 600 million EC dollars, which, is, which of course comprises the principal, the VAT, the penalties, and the interest. I ran it by a businessman only yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and he said, well, you know, I owe the government quite a bit of, of, of taxes. And it's somewhere in the vicinity of $10 million. He said, you know what happened? I'm going and get a loan to pay all my taxes because I will get it waived. That is, that is the impact of this initiative, Mr. Speaker. It is be being prepared to take the bold decisions. To, to take those bold decisions, but knowing that those decisions will have a positive impact on the other side, and then they will come forward and give the government what is due to it. So just imagine, Mr. Speaker, one businessman who owes $10 million is saying, I am going to go and take a loan and pay the $6 million that I owe the government. Just imagine, Mr. Speaker, if 10 businessmen in this country, and I'm sure there are more than 10, if 10 businessmen in this country they owe 600 million. Just imagine the 600 million. If 300 million is really um, due, not duties, um, penalties and interest, just imagine, Mr. Speaker, those individuals all go to get a loan just to clear the, 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 the taxes, the impact that will have on the revenue of the country, of this, the, the revenue of the government of this country. So, Mr. Speaker, this is the creativity of the budget. This is the imagination of the budget. This is the sensitivity of the budget, Mr. Speaker. This is the compassion of the budget. The compassion for the people who need it. The creativity to ensure that your decisions will bring reward. And to make sure that you maintain your country on an even keel to, to, to reflect economic growth and development and to stimulate the economy and to encourage and give hope to young people through the youth economy, to give hope to small business through the S -S -S -M -M -E, MSME, to give hope to the ordinary man, the fishers, by giving them one dollar a bit to say to them, we understand what you're going through. We appreciate the service you're giving to this country, so we're giving you back something. That's what this government is about. We're not just taking. We are giving back. So, Mr. Speaker, I really hope that our people understand what we're doing. So when we come to you and we say to you that we are introducing a two percent levy for health and security and you begin to see your security in the country improving and the police are responding and you begin to feel safe in this country then you realize the health services are improving that when you go to the health center to the clinic to the wellness centers and to the hospitals you realize the services are improving, you will understand the importance of the 2%. And so, Mr. Speaker, having said this, I want to move to my ministry. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, in his budget address, spoke of the work that the Ministry of Infrastructure will undertake in this financial year. Of course, whereas the theme of the budget did not reflect the Department of Infrastructure, we understand the purpose of the budget. But with this, the Department has a number of projects, critical projects, that we are already engaging in. The Department of Infrastructure will, in this year, accelerate its general maintenance of St. Lucia's road network to attend to urgent maintenance needs on our roads, bridges, and other public infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, this is important 
Because in the last year, we were challenged with the climatic conditions, climate change, heavy rainfalls, and some of them ridiculed us and said, well, you know, the science and all this sort of thing, you all talk about science, and you can't fix roads in, in the rain. I want them to go and fix their road in the rain. <laughs> So we have decided this year, and the Prime Minister has more or less agreed, that if only we can be given up front, early in the financial year, the resources, our road maintenance program will continue unabated. I am sure those of you who drive around, because all of us drive anyway, who drive around, I'm sure you realize that throughout the country, particularly our primary road network, we have done quite a bit of work in terms of maintenance. And so I must take this opportunity to thank the Prime Minister, who this year, towards the end of the year, gave us an additional $2.5 million to go into road maintenance and to do the volume and the quality of work that you see happening on our roads. Mr. Prime Minister, let me assure you that we will continue to persevere and to pursue the agenda which you have given us. In fact, so as to motivate the men, I have requested and planned a special appreciation event for them in the next two Fridays after the jazz. And I'm hoping that Prime Minister, you and other colleagues will be able to come into that event so that you can express your appreciation. And if you have any, any um, disappointments, you can also express those disappointments. The, uh, the, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the purpose of this is to show appreciation. And that's what this government is all about. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of critical roads or infrastructure that we, must, we, we are continuing. The Millennium Highway, which we have been speaking about for a long time, Millennium Highway and West Coast Road project continues. A number of community roads are currently receiving attention under the, the design finance construct model. Um, and it is anticipated that once government's prudential fiscal limits under the DFC model is satisfactory achieved, a number of other communities will see improvements to their roads. I've, of course, I've got to ensure that in so doing that the Prime Minister has that space. He has that space to be able to recommit himself to doing any more DFCs. Because while we would like to do what the people need, we also have to understand we cannot overburden the resources of the country if we do not have it. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we're now moving into the sustainable, Renewable Energy Sustainable Development Project, and that I will go back to uh, uh, later. So the first major project, Mr. Speaker, the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road Project, that project was funded under the, under the CDB, uh, through the CDB, sorry, under what is called the UK CIF um, Grant Funding, United Kingdom Caribbean Infrastructure Fund. Cost of $43,287,000. The project is to improve and rehabilitate the Millennium Highway, which is 6.2 km kilometers. The reconstruction of 24.6 kilometers on the west coast, which goes from, um, from Bannans Bay, sorry, from um, Cul-de-Sac through to Ansari and ending at Columbet, and the construction of what I call the South Bridge at Ansari. The Millennium Highway is from the Bannans roundabout to the cul-de-sac junction where a new roundabout is being constructed and that will connect to the West Coast Road. We have had some problems, Mr. Speaker, in the last 18 or rather 22 months with the present contractor on the Millennium Highway. That project, Mr. Speaker, is behind time. The project should have completed in March we are now in April, going into May, and so, Mr. Speaker, the contractor has been asked to speed up because it is too far gone, even though it's only 27% attained, 
we need to get the project going because the project that is the Millennium Highway is holding back the other segments of the road. For example, the Japanese funded and constructed Japanese bridge in cul-de-sac, that bridge has been completed in record time, within time. Excellent work within the budget. Completed, and it's amazing when you have two contractors working in the same environment, that one is able to come in and get the job done and move out, while the other one is there to use the local panel, TTV, and, and trying to find reasons why it cannot be done. But Mr. Speaker, that road is important so as we can move on to the West Coast Road, for which a contractor is in country having received a contract through the Caribbean Development Bank. Now, Mr. Speaker, I need to probably at this time just segue a little bit and to speak about the second and third phases of the Millennium, I'm um, sorry, the West Coast Highway. And it is probably an issue that is troubling a few people because of what they have seen ever since the contractor landed here over the weekend. There are those who are saying that, well, you know, they have come with all the equipment, huge equipment, etc., etc., and there's so much equipment in St. Lucia, and we're not given we're not given an opportunity, Mr. Speaker. It was an international tender, Mr. Speaker. This government is very, very, very conscious of the needs of our people. We are very caring, and we always look out to our, for our people. Mr. Speaker, the tender which was issued for this project was an international tender. The funding for the project came from the UK government as a gift to the Caribbean, St. Lucia being one of the islands benefiting from that gift. Jamaica, Dominica, Antigua, they all got their own portion. St. Lucia got 43 million US dollars. The terms and condition for any CDB project demands international participation, particularly from member countries, all the member states. So the bank, the member states of the CDB are the CARICOM region and the lending countries, the UK, China, Canada, and I think it's Brazil, or one of them. But the lending countries, those countries who have come forward to say that we are prepared to buy or, or, or participate in the bank as a lending um, partner, you are the borrowing partners. But whenever there are tenders, we believe it must be internationally put out there. The bidding document, Mr. Speaker, is very specific. And the bidding document says that as a contractor, you've got to demonstrate that you have capacity. You've got to demonstrate that you have capacity, not just a name, like asphalt and mining, and you come with your hands swinging, but a name and equipment and personnel and expertise. But it also says, Mr. Speaker, that that contractor must also subcontract to local uh, contractors. These are the conditions. When the contract was first um, negotiated, Mr. Speaker, or when it was first put out there, the international tender, the, the, ratio, of, be, the ratio between the contractor, the successful contractor, and the, the subcontractors was 70-30. 70-30. That means the contractor would be able to have, um, would, would be able to have, seven, no, it's 60-40. The contractor would be able to have 60% um, 60%, 60 in terms of the, the direct involvement and the subcontractors would be given 40% award of contracts. A 
upon review, we decided, Mr. Speaker, in this contract, and you remember the one which was done, the first contract was done in, in 2021 or there about, 20, 2019, 2021, Mr. Speaker. It was signed in May of 2021. And so, Mr. Speaker, having done that, this government said we need to, we need to get a little more. And what we have done is to reverse the, the ratio and to allow local tenders to be able to get as much as 70% portion of the tendering, pro the subcontracting process. So in other words, there are great, uh, greater opportunities under the arrangement that, that, that's, that's made here. But Mr. Speaker, the, what is also interesting is that the tender document indicated the pieces of equipment that are required for the project. So the list is here. It says 15 ton or higher hydraulic excavators, 15 tons or higher hydraulic elevators, um, es excavators, sorry. Okay, and they gave you the, they gave you the list. It says that any single lot one, lot two B two, any combination of lot lots excluding two B two and any combination of two or more lots, including lot 2B3. So in other words, just so that one piece of equipment, a combination, so they tell you. So if you go down there, there shouldn't be more than one 15 ton or higher hydraulic excavator. Now, Mr. Speaker, with all the equipment we have around, it may be very difficult to get a 15 ton hydraulic excavator. I may be wrong. But you know one of the problems we have in, this, in, in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, everybody has an excavator. Everybody. Everybody has an excavator. They have Baku. They have all kinds of things. When you, when you call them and you say, listen, we have a job for you, and they say, yes, I, I want it. They take three, four, five days before they can mobilize. I had a joke, Mr. Speaker. We had a project to do somewhere, and a contractor, an equipment operator said, yes, he's, he can make it. And it took him so long to get there, even when he got there, the equipment broke down by the time it dipped for once into the river. But we need to organize ourselves. The 20 ton tipper trucks, Mr. Speaker, 20 ton, three. 200 HP motor grader, one. And the list goes on, Mr. Speaker, indicating the number of pieces of equipment that are required. So the equipment that is there, Mr. Speaker, that you see out there, which will be engaged in the reconstruction of the West Coast Road, which comprises some 64 kilometers. Okay? Some 64 kilometers, Mr. Speaker. That equipment is not all of the equipment that is required. And so I do hope that I've explained it sufficiently for those who are concerned about the um, the number of equipment that they have seen um, stacked up in the cul-de-sac valley and for those who are concerned of the impact that that will have on their own business here in St. Lucia. And so Mr. Speaker, that's lot two and lot one and lot two. Lot two to speed up We'll take in the cul-de-sac bridge to Ansari, the Ansari bridge, the Ansari bridge to Canaries, Canaries to Sufre, and the total cost of that is $47.2 million. As I said, Mr. Speaker, the cul-de-sac bridge is complete, and I must take some time on at this occasion on behalf of the government and people of St. Lucia to extend our wishes, our best wishes, and thanks, sincere thanks, and gratitude to the government and people of Japan for this landmark bridge in cul-de-sac uh, to date the longest bridge in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, now that the bridge has been completed, we are now in the process of negotiating with the Japanese to do a second bridge. And this one, Mr. Speaker, will be done again in the cul-de-sac basin, uh, more or less, at Ferens. That, Mr. Speaker, will help improve the hydraulics of the river because as they build the bridges, they build them wider, longer, and higher. And of course, the passage is, is, is expanded to allow for free flow of water, thus 
creating the, the kind of hydraulics necessary to speed up the flow in the basin. Mr. Speaker, one of the projects which we have just completed, which was um, done by the last government, started with the last government, is the, the RIMP, Road Improvement Management um, Program, Phase 4. And that project is nearing completion. In fact, it has come to an end. And we are just going through the defects liability period. And for this, Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank the people, government and people of the Republic of China, Taiwan, for the collaboration and the generosity they have extended to St. Lucia over the years. There are some other specific areas, Mr. Speaker, I would like to now go into quickly. For this financial year, Mr. Speaker, one project which has been identified and for which I have received, Mr. Speaker, quite a bit of pressure from the parliamentary representative who is absent today is the construction of the Austin Hill Road, costing $750,000, Mr. Speaker, and that is located somewhere in the constituency of Denry North. I haven't visited yet, Mr. Speaker, but I will go and see that, that, that um, road and to ensure that it is done. We also have, Mr. Speaker, an amount of $2.5 million for slope stabilization, retaining walls, and that, Mr. Speaker, is an annual program to assist in places where the walls are coming down and we need to stabilize the slopes. $2.5 million, not necessarily sufficient, Mr. Speaker, but it's even better than what it was last year. And I thank the Minister for Finance for this um, um, allocation. Bridges and culverts, Mr. Speaker, an allocation of $1.9 million has been given um, to demolish existing, the, one, the existing cul-de-sac bridge and to assist in the reconstruction of a number of bridges and strengthening of a number of bridges. Some of them include the shock bridge, um, which we are hoping that we can repair rather than reconstruct at this time, because those of you who drive, I'm sure you'll realize there is a dip on that bridge. It, mean, it, mean, it means that the AMCO pipes at the bottom of the bridge is now collapsing because of age. Uh, it's not one of those ordinary um, deck bridges. It's one which is designed with two huge cylindrical pipes uh, and those pipes are now deteriorating. Also, we, we're looking at Trunasi Bridge, Kwanem Bridge, which has been very problematic over the years. Every, every now and then we've got to go in there and try to underpin it. Then you have the Denry Main Bridge and the Boskido Bridge. All of these, Mr. Speaker, are bridges that we need to undertake. But Mr. Speaker, recently we did invest in some equipment, both in the lab and, of course, uh, alongside the engineering unit. And one of the systems we have introduced, Mr. Speaker, is a system called an asset management system, a road maintenance uh, management system. And that is to allow us to avoid what has happened in the past. In the past, what you recognize is that we, the Ministry of Infrastructure, or the Department of Infrastructure, was simply responding. They were reactive. The improvement in the asset management system, Mr. Speaker, allows for continuous um, inspection and, um, and an assessment of bridges and culverts and the roads itself to see the level of stress and deterioration that, deterioration that is taking place and to respond in a timely manner. So instead of being reactive, we've been proactive. And hopefully, if the system is applied properly, Mr. Speaker, we'll see less um, um, sudden crashes of the, of, of the landscape and bridges, as we have seen. The battle is one, one place where we have had a, a number of mudslides and landslides and most times we are not ready for such and we have to be running helter-skelter to make sure we put things in place. So the asset management system would help in that regard. We have, Mr. Speaker, also reconstruction and rehabilitation of roads and the allocation, um, it's sort of small, $4 million. Ideally, Mr. Speaker, if we are to respond to the reconstruction and rehabilitation of roads based on the um, you know, the rate at which roads are, are deteriorating, we really would need to spend $20 million a year. And spending $20 million a year to, to, to reconstruct and rehabilitate 
uh, then you put your, your asset management system in place and if that is again administered properly then roads would last beyond the, the pavement strength and most roads are designed to have a pavement strength for the Minister of Health would know life expectancy in human beings, what's the life expectancy of male and female and in the, in the case of roads they don't say life expectancy because roads have no life but they have a pavement strength and based on the pavement strength it would determine how long that road would last. Most roads are designed, Mr. Speaker, for 15, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so we are hoping that when we put those systems in place, Mr. Speaker, we will be able to monitor and to be able to extend the, 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 the life of the road or the, or the, um, the, um, the integrity of the road for a longer period. Because if you can do that, then it means you can do in, um, preemptive um, maintenance and to extend it. Mr. Speaker, what costs maintenance? We are now revisiting the issue of the silting. The silting is a word in our communities that people believe can solve all their problems, apart from the silting. And so, Mr. Speaker, we realize the impact of the silting on our landscape itself. Because what happens, Mr. Speaker, is when you go in, and, and the Minister for Agriculture is not here, and we have to work hand in glove, because he has to, he spoke about the, the riverbanks, you know, the riverbanks, uh, but of course, the riverbanks are, are to protect the river course. But when we get into the rivers, and we start extracting what is there, then we cause them to, we cause the rivers to improve its, its hydraulics, and as a result of the improvement in the hydraulics, then what you have is... Member for Castries um, North, you have 10 minutes left. Yes. <laughs> Just give me another 10. 15. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I wish to invoke Sunday in Orders 3210 to allow the Honorable Member an extra 15 minutes to complete his presentation. Honourable Members, the question is that Standing Order 3210 be invoked to allow the Member for Castries North an additional 15 minutes in which to conclude his presentation. And now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Proceed, Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I will move on quickly so as to attempt to conclude my presentation. So I'm speaking of the Silton, Mr. Speaker, and, and the, the new approach, and that is maintenance of river, um, of water courses, and that will attempt to ensure that we provide, the, we um, protect the riverbed and work with the Department of Agriculture in the protection of the riverbank. Maintenance of government buildings, Mr. Speaker, 1.68, million dollars. Mr. Speaker, it is okay, but we need to revisit the issue of government buildings. Government buildings, Mr. Speaker, must be maintained. We cannot continue to abandon government buildings because of mold, because of whatever it is, and, and most of the government buildings, Mr. Speaker, that we abandon are not, are not the, the problem are, isn't structural. It is air quality. It is mold. It's just sick buildings, Mr. Speaker. And the only thing that can solve sick buildings is to ensure that you have a maintenance regime that will, a maintenance regime that will extend the life of, of those buildings. That is, what is, that is what we need, Mr. Speaker. And I'm hoping that at some stage we'll be able to take this into consideration and deal with that aspect of government buildings. We have to take it serious, Mr. Speaker, because even the quality of paint that is used, we issue contracts to small contractors. They go and buy cheap paint. It is not mold resistant, not mildew resistant, and then we end up with, with mold and mildew. The Department of Infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, will be undertaking a study to really try and understand the issue of sick buildings and the mold infestation throughout the public service. 
Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we have to take action and stop moving out there and renting buildings. The Prime Minister will tell you the, 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 the rental charges, the rental fees that we pay. Look now, we have been committed, Mr. Speaker, to a building at Bois d'Orange. A million dollars a month, I'm told. We can build a new building for ourselves. So, Mr. Speaker, the idea is to look at the design and construction of buildings, look at the air quality, look at the refrigeration, the, the, the plumbing and, 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 and electronics and, and, and the mechanical in, um, instruments of the building and make sure that whatever we're doing is good and will not interfere with our buildings. And finally, Mr. Speaker, the caretaker and maintenance, what we call the caretaker maintenance program, $1.6 million, Mr. Speaker. Again, good, but if at all, Mr. Speaker, we are truly serious about tourism, then we must be truly serious about our environment. We must be able to maintain our environment, maintain the roads, maintain the, the, the curbs, the vegetation, to instead of just simply debushing, we need to be manicuring our, our environment so that it looks pristine. When people come in here, they can see an environment that is beautiful, flowers and lawns, etc., etc. But that will call for a greater investment than $1.6 million. Mr. Speaker, let me move quickly to Renewable Energy Sector Development Project, which is a geothermal project in Sufre. And I know there's a lot of talk going on about, about renewable energy. There are a lot of gurus out there, Mr. Speaker, who who understand it probably more than I do, and who probably have greater answers than I do. Uh, and there are people also, Mr. Speaker, who are very energetic in getting it going, who are very, very, um, very confident about this sector and the expectation of the sector in terms of what it can do to reduce costs and to increase productivity in this country. But Mr. Speaker, we in St. Lucia, we did develop, and, 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 and we continue to, to follow it. We have developed what is called the na National, the national e um, Energy Transition um, Strategy, which more or less speaks to where we should go with energy. Geothermal, solar, wind, and of course a mix of fossil, fossil fuel. Because if we truly understand, Mr. Speaker, while we all want to go into renewable energy, we have to make sure that there is something to fall back on if the sun don't shine for two weeks. Because when the sun don't shine, your, 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 your uh, PV system on your rooftop will not produce energy. So we have to make sure that we maintain that balance. We have to make sure that the system is stable. And so we, while I, would, I understand that we want to move quickly, but we have to make sure when we move, we move to ensure that the system, the system is stable and it can provide the, 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 the energy that we're looking for. So the Renewable Energy Sector Development Project, Mr. Speaker, is really the geothermal project. It's a project costing $21.9 million, which we may never recover because, and that's more, that more or less is a grant given to us by the World Bank um, to do the final stages of exploration um, in the country. Whereas we have done, done previous explore, exploratory exercises, we have discovered that there is ge geothermal energy, but we were not able to determine the capacity uh, of the geothermal that is under there. So in the coming, as we speak, there is a project officer which has been established. Um, and the, the consultants are in and out working with the, the department. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the, the project is viable. We want to make sure if there is energy that the resource can be generated. And of course, the enabling environment to scale up renewables, um, uh, renewable investment with the private sector is established. Now, Mr. Speaker, the most critical part of this initiative, Mr. Speaker, is the legislation. The old legislation, Mr. Speaker, recognizes one power producer. One power producer in the in, in loose That's the only power producer. The legislation surrounds loose The legis um, in that, Mr. Speaker, loose itself owns the power grid, the poles, the electricity, the, the lines, etc. 
so no other person can get onto those poles or do anything because they control it. There is a, an agreement under the law which ends sometime in 2040 thereabout. So as we speak, Mr. Speaker, we have completed the draft legislation and we are now going into what I call the final bit of consultation to ensure that all the I's are dotted and the T's crossed with the hope that we can come to Parliament in June for the passage of the new Electricity Act, which will liberalize that sector. What it means, Mr. Speaker, is that it will provide for LUSLAC to survive, for individuals to be able to set on their rooftops the photovoltaic systems and to produce their own electricity, to be able to sell, consume rather, first, and sell to LUSLAC, or to consume all and sell all, as they say, to a net metering uh, um, system to allow you to be able to consume what you require and sell the balance to loosely. All of these, Mr. Speaker, we need to put together and to ensure that there are regulations controlling and governing this system. It means, Mr. Speaker, with renewable energy, the sector development program, it means that there will be, no, there will be more than one producer, one, more than one generator. So it's not Lusnek alone generating electricity. I will be gen generating electricity. And I will sell to Lusnek to give to those who don't have PV on their rooftops. But we also have another issue to deal with, Mr. Speaker, because the cost of maintaining the grid, the poles and the, and, and, and the, the, the cables, etc., is that of, the, of Lusnek. And so we also have to strike a balance as to how much renewable energy that we will allow for independent power producers and the, gen and the population to generate, and how much loose leg itself should generate to ensure that loose leg itself remains sustainable to maintain that grid. So as we speak about renewables, Mr. Speaker, and we speak about reducing the cost of energy, we also have to think that there is a grid to maintain that we need to depend on because we will not be totally independent unless we find a resource that is sustainable. And the resource that we're thinking of, Mr. Speaker, if we're able to get it, that can sustain us is the geothermal resource. Solar will not be able to sustain us entirely. As I said, there'll be days you'll wake up and your solar water heater is cold and your light bulb will be black because you won't have any electricity. So if only, Mr. Speaker, and we're hoping that we can, we, we can, um, we can proceed with the project and um, the exploration drilling will commence in the coming months. We are looking at a number of places in the Sufra re region. There are three to four slim wells in Belle Plaine to be done. That's in Fort Saint Jacques. We have done consultation there already, and I'm hoping that the people have bought into the idea. Mon Liza is one, that's in Mondesi, and in, in Saltibus. And this is to access and confirm the viability, as I said, Mr. Speaker, for development of an estimated 30 megawatt um, geothermal power plant. The other thing that will happen, Mr. Speaker, is that currently, under the arrangement that exists, an individual is able to generate five kilowatts of electricity. And a business place is allowed to generate 25 kilowatts. When the renewable energy um, system comes into place, when people can now go in freely and get their renewables, get their photovoltaic systems and get their battery storage and to be able to store power, generate and store power, the Electricity Act will now provide for an increase in the volume of production for you. So whereas we at five, it may go up to 25 for domestic. I'm not saying that's where it will go, but it may go up to 25, it may go up to 50, it may go up to 100 to the, to the business places. But the whole idea, as I said earlier on, is to bring about a, a balance. This, Mr. Speaker, as a consequence, the project has hired an exploration management consultancy firm, US $3.5 million. There's an engagement of civil and infrastructure works contractors, 1.8 million US dollars, and there's a con contracting um, con uh, contractor for drilling services, 
and that is $13.2 million, Mr. Speaker. All of that money, Mr. Speaker, as we speak now, th that, all of that money is really grant funding. If we find the resource, and the resource is sufficient enough to generate electricity, then it converts into a loan, and the government would have to pay that loan. But what it does, Mr. Speaker, is once you can find the resource, the government pays the loan, but the government can leverage to the private sector and then attract um, private sector investment to get involved in the, um, in the project. The project has five sources, Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Clean Energy Forest Climate, 3.7 million, Clean Technology Fund, uh, 8.572 million, Canadian, Canadian Clean Energy and Forest Climate Fund, um, 0.55 million, and the government of St. Lucia will put $1 million for land acquisition, etc., um, uh, for the project. Mr. Speaker, out of this project, we were able to get the, a number of students, a cohort of 10 students who were given scholarships to study and to understand the whole issue of geothermal um, generation and to prepare them for the future and possible jobs in, in the sector. Mr. Speaker, I want to quickly mention that in all of this, you need the regulator. The regulator is the NUC, and the NUC, which was established um, sometime in 2015, they have been struggling along. They have not been able to attract or generate the resources they require for their sustainability. And this year, the government has decided to give them an increase in their subvention of $250,000, which will assist them in their administration costs um, in running the office, and um, to hope that the NUC can um, improve on its services and to be able to train its members, etc. Uh, once the legislation goes by and the, 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 the sector is liberated, then it means the loose deck will come under the NUC. As it is now, only uh, WASCO is being regulated. Loose deck is not regulated, uh, except by the Ministry of Infrastructure in terms of the routine inspections that we normally have to do every, um, every two years. Uh, the NUC then will come in and set the regulation, and Loose deck would have to pay the NUC a percentage of its revenue to keep the NUC going and to be able to give them the necessary professional competence to run the system. So that basically, Mr. Speaker, is um, the uh, sort of a dashboard of what is expected um, to happen. We are still pursuing, Mr. Speaker, our, our, our target of 35% renewable energy penetration by the year 2025. We're not there yet. We're still a long way ahead, but there is need to push. And one of the ways we will attain this, Mr. Speaker, is the support uh, within the public service to be able to get the necessary competence and manpower needs of the um, energy unit to be able to, to pursue our national agenda, but also to capitalize and piggyback on the numerous uh, um, funding that is out there that we need to go out searching. There's a lot of funding out there, Mr. Speaker. There's the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. Uh, recently, we're able to um, get them to agree on a $50 million grant loan, grant loan, um, which Luslek is interested in. But it's just, just one of, of many opportunities that exist out there where we can, we, we can um, access. The NUC, Mr. Speaker, has done a, quite a bit of work. The, the, the CEO has been really an asset ever since she took up her responsibility. And so the NUC has be, been able to benefit on training in what we call the National Energy Grid Code. And that is important, the grid code meaning that as you begin to mix the energy and having fu fossil fuel generation, solar generation, probably ocean tech generation, wind tech generation, and geothermal, all of these, Mr. Speaker, are not generating at the same capacity and the same rhythm, if I should use that term, at any given time. So what you're likely to have, Mr. Speaker, because they're not generating at the same pace, then you'd have instability in the grid, and at your home, you'll also have that instability. So you now need to be able to, one, 
find the details of the technical requirements. So the grid code, Mr. Speaker, is really the code that will tell you what are the technical requirements necessary for you to participate in the, in, in the national grid in terms of connecting to and using the grid to ensure that there is stability. So they have done quite a bit of work in that area, Mr. Speaker, and I must commend the, the Chief Executive Officer and the NUC, the Board of the, the, the Commission, for the work they have done. They have been able, Mr. Speaker, to, to get grant funding from the Caribbean Development Bank um, to do a strategic and operational plan together with a grievance mechanism for dealing with customer complaints and disputes. And that is the, that is the, 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 the benefit of the, of, of the of um, the renewable energy system, in, uh, the, the regulator would be able to put those, those um, structures in place and to ensure that persons who have complaints can report and get their, their complaints dealt with. Um, and so, Mr. Speaker, in an attempt to speed up, I'll skip a few things. We, um, again, through the NUC, they have been able to um, also get assistance in dealing with renewable energy pricing and capacity limits, what I just spoke early on, to be able to determine at what stage do you give them, um, at what, how do you regulate the prices? Remember, you have five minutes remaining. Okay. What contributes to pricing, Mr. Speaker, and to be able to regulate this, and they have been able to get um, assistance through the Global uh, Green Energy Institute, the GGI. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of initiatives which the NUC has been involved in. They have worked with the World Bank. They have worked with um, the Regulatory Energy Transition Accelerator. They have done work with the, um, as I said, the GGI and other regional and international agencies in their effort, Mr. Speaker to bring about that kind of regulatory mechanism. Mr. Speaker, WASCO, WASCO is one agency that um, we need to continue to give support. They are trying, and they fall, Mr. Speaker, at this time, right at a time when the ministry is considering uh, launching a program called Infrastructure 2030. And what Infrastructure 2030, Mr. Speaker, is, is a determined and deliberate program intended to begin to think beyond now, to think to 2030 and beyond, where this country is likely to go. So if I'm supposed to go by what the Prime Minister has said in his budget and the plans which he has, the hotels which are to be built, what it says to me, Mr. Speaker, as Minister for Infrastructure, it means that I need to have the proper road network. I need to have, as Minister for Public Utilities, a strong public utility infrastructure. I need to have in place a strong telecommunications sector, Mr. Speaker. I need to have that environment. I need to have strong sewer facilities and all of these things. And so Infrastructure 2030 gives an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to renew our infrastructure, to ask ourselves, is our infrastructure for water in place? And I can tell you no. Because so often, what do you see? As we build a road, next week, it's like loose, um, Wasco smells the, the asphalt, and they're there digging. But what is happening there, Mr. Speaker, is because of the road construction and the compaction during construction, that vibration, the aging infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, deteriorates to the extent that weeks after, or days after, or even during the time of construction, it breaks up. So for us, it is an investment that we have to make to say, let us do an audit of all of our infra infrastructure. Put in new lines and say, listen, we want lines on the day that will last 20 years. Then we build a road that will last 20 years. Then we may take a decision that line should not be under the road pavement, but should be on the side of the road. Then electricity. Where are we going in the next, 20, in the next seven years and beyond, in the year, year 2030? We speak of a north-south link road from Grosley to Denry. What is likely to happen? What is likely to happen, Mr. Speaker, is the potential of not just a road, but the opening up of a vista of opportunities, a community, maybe a new village, a tourism um, place. Then your water requirements, your water needs increases, and you need to have that infrastructure in place. You know Cabot came to St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. And what did we find? 
Carbot doesn't have, or we don't have the capacity to pump enough water to Carbot based on the size of that facility. The Royalton came in, and we're having problems. So Infrastructure 2030, Mr. Speaker, is a program that will allow us to be able to review our infrastructure, to augment what is existing, and to put in place an infrastructure plan that will be geared for 2030 and beyond. And that program, Mr. Speaker, we are hoping we can, last, we can launch this year. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I spoke of water. Briefly, I went in. Again, under water and infrastructure is the question of the John Compton Dam. This one is a story by itself. We spent quite a bit of money, Mr. Speaker. A dredging fund was established, and after spending 60 million thereabout, Mr. Speaker, we were only able, and I say we, because whether it's this government or the government before, all that was, all that was achieved was 10% dredging. $60 million. And that is an issue we need to deal with, Mr. Speaker, so as to attempt to improve on our water supply and to be able to provide to our people and to the investment that is likely to come into the, into the country. So, Mr. Speaker, there have been also some projects which were undertaken and they are um, more or less completing. The Viewfort Water Supply Project, the John Compton Dam still, uh, Spillway, the Denry North Water Supply Project, um, an amount of 187,000 and 173,000 being allocated. Um, the, re the rehabilitation and upgrade of the Northern Water Distribution Pipeline, which was... Member, you, you need to wrap up now. I will wrap up now, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, this gives you a synopsis of the program of the Department of Infrastructure, which I have not yet touched the issue of airports and seaports and what we are doing there, what we are doing. I have not spoken of the green energy, Caribbean efficient green energy buildings, Mr. Speaker. And if, if I may indulge, just to quickly indicate that St. Lucia and Grenada has been se selected for a World Bank project called Caribbean Efficiency and Green Energy Buildings. And what this is going to do, Mr. Speaker, is really to do an audit of our green of our buildings, public buildings, and other institutions that the government may select, whether pri um, quasi government or government itself, to do an energy audit and to be able to retrofit those buildings to bring about a reduction in your price of electricity consumption. Now, this, Mr. Speaker, is probably the one project that will impact us almost immediately. Geothermal will impact us. Maybe in the next, I may not be here in the parliament may impact us maybe in another 10 years. But energy efficiency, the ability to change your infrastructure, your lighting fixtures, and your light bulbs, and other amenities to drive your prices down, once we do that, Mr. Speaker, we'll see the prices going down and we'll benefit from it. All the others call for massive investment, whether it's you know, geothermal, etc., etc. I have a bit, Mr. Speaker, I will pass it on to my colleague, uh, Minister for Housing, and he will deal with it. It was just to give you, um, from the SNASA's standpoint, um, information on the position of SNASA and as far as the land at Latok, not Tapia, but Latok, which was purchased by a private sector concern. So, so uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you very much for your tolerance, your patience, your understanding, and I look forward to your encouragement in the future and in closing I also want to say thank you to my staff, my permanent secretaries um, and a number of others within the public service. I want to commend the Prime Minister and his staff in the Department of Finance who have worked very hard. Um, I know those days are considered by me because I remember my time I call it red, ide red ideas. You work until 3, 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning and you back up at 7 o'clock to get things going. I want to commend you sir on your work and to say thank you and God bless you.